بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us who are here and all of our loved ones and everyone who facilitated this conference. Say Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the countless volunteers, the staff, the mashayikh, the students of knowledge and everyone who puts this together. Say Ameen. I want to begin by asking a question. So we're going to need some responses inshallah. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was with us today, what are some things that would cause him, maybe in our minds we could imagine, would cause him to smile? What are some things that if he were to see, let's say, here in Michigan, it would make him happy, he would smile? Let's hear some responses, inshallah ta'ala. Who can give us a response? Yes. Loudly. Louder. These large gatherings, excellent. Jazakumullah khairan, excellent. In the middle. Unity, the Muslims being united, excellent. Sister side, what are some things that would make the Prophet ﷺ happy? The beautiful masajid, the beauty within the masajid as well, excellent. The communities, excellent. Okay, the ease of giving da'wah, especially in the West. Diversity amongst the Muslim ummah, excellent, in the middle. Talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's not here. Excellent. One more response on the sister side, inshallah. Excellent. The smiles of the Muslims to one another. Imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His conference is mercy to mankind. You're going to be saying a lot of salawat and it is for your benefit. It is for our benefit. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imagine he were to see the masajid just in Michigan. The diversity of the masajid, the unity of the Muslims praying in the masajid, despite some of our differences. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ seeing the Muslim ummah just a few weeks ago in the month of Ramadan, how packed the masajid were, how the community was begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, for guidance, how happy the masajid were with the many diverse faces, with the many repentant hearts looking to change and grow. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ seeing the gatherings like this today. A gathering that is themed after his mission and his message alayhi salatu wasalam. How happy would he be? Imagine the Prophet ﷺ seeing all the youngsters who are here today and throughout the year seeking knowledge with eagerness, with passion. Like the companions, they were learning about Islam as it was being revealed. And some of the companions were young. And some were old, men and women. The Prophet ﷺ would be happy to see that today. Imagine the many institutes, Islamic centers, organizations, whose sole mission is to facilitate Islam, to make it easy to practice, to understand. How happy would the Prophet ﷺ be? Imagine the Prophet ﷺ seeing a young Muslim today in the United States of America struggling to practice Islam, but they're holding on to their faith struggling to practice Islam with societal pressures. But what do they do? They're holding on to their Islam. They're holding on to their hijab, their salah, their practice, their character. Imagine the Prophet wasallam seeing the Muslims today who are practicing Islam properly, representing Islam with their character, with their smiles, with their kindness, with loved ones and with people who are distant to them. On the other end of the spectrum, a heavy question is, what would make the Prophet ﷺ sad, disappointed if he were to see the communities today? The Prophet ﷺ would likely be sad to see division in our communities, division in our organizations, injustice of any form, injustice towards those who are neglected, those who are marginalized, those who are ignored in society. The Prophet ﷺ would be sad to see that state of affairs. The Prophet ﷺ would be sad to see harshness as part of our traits or our characters. Harshness behind closed doors, not just in public, amongst old and young, men and women. Imagine parents mistreated by their children, children mistreated by their parents. Husbands mistreating their wives and wives mistreating their husbands. Would the Prophet ﷺ be happy or sad to see that? Imagine the Prophet ﷺ seeing Islamic centers that have no youth, 
No youth programs, no youngsters attending the masjid, no children running around in the back, yes, at times making noise, running between the rows, like many of us have growing up in many of these masajid. What does that represent when he, sallallahu alayhi wa would pray, and on his back, while Hassan al-Hussein, radiallahu anhuma, how would the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa feel? Or nationalism. Imagine how disappointed the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa would be if he were to hear a Muslim today saying, I'm better than such and such. Or look at those people from that country, or that race, or that ethnicity. How disappointing would that be? Nationalism and the dangers of nationalism and what it takes away from unity, from Islam, from a pure heart, from humility. My mother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her and preserve her and all of her mothers around the world teaches in a school and recently shared the story. Some of the students would come up to her and ask her, Miss, where are you from? What's your ethnicity? What's your background? And she would ask why. She would hear things. You hear students, and some of us know how it is in schools at times. So some students would say, well, we're from such and such place. We're the best. I'm from this country. We're the best. My mom told me we're the best. And she would respond, I'm not going to tell you where I'm from because it doesn't matter. What matters is your kindness, your character, your righteousness, the things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all they're doing is coming up to her and asking, where are you from? Are you from Turkey? Are you from Lebanon? Are you from Palestine? Are you from Yemen? On and on and on and on. Now this might sound innocent because it's children. But what they're learning from maybe their parents or elders or older siblings, when they hear the jokes that you think are innocent, but the jokes that are filled with stereotypes, the jokes that are embedded with racism. How can you ever utter something of racism and say, yes, I'm following the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, who in the final moments of his life in the farewell speech emphasized this point, inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum, the most honorable of you, are those who are the most God conscious. The Prophet wasallam would not like to see nationalism as a disease as it is today amongst our community. May Allah protect us. Allahumma ameen. People's habits, people's lifestyles, people's clothes today, the lack of modesty in society, the things that we consume, the things that we follow, the people that we look up to, the people we admire, the people that we watch, the countless forms of entertainment in multiple forms. The Prophet wasallam, would he be pleased with the things that we are consuming and producing as a community? And those who abandon the message of the Prophet وسلم, or the ahadith, the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, or those who fall for the traps of pseudo-intellectual arguments, shubuhat, that have no substance, whether it's coming from atheists or agnostics or Christians or anyone else, falling into that trap and holding on to a lifestyle of misguidance, or those who fall into the traps of extremism and violence that tarnish the image of Islam and they have nothing to do with the merciful messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be happy to see us 1400 years later, today, to see us worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trying our best, not giving up, learning about Allah, learning about the Qur'an, studying this deen, and embracing the purpose of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for, especially when things are difficult, when you go through hardship, when you're going through a difficult situation with people or individually, with health or with wealth, whether your job or your studies or anything else, that you held on to your faith, you held on to your Islam, that you continue to make dua, that you always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you kept trying. And every time you fell down, you stood back up. Every time you fell into a sin and felt like you lost a battle, you repented and returned to Allah, so you won. At the end of the day, you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be happy to see that today, alhamdulillah, much of our ummah is reviving knowledge, reviving unity, reviving the things that are pleasing to Allah, reviving the pursuit of justice for all people, speaking on behalf of those who are oppressed all around the world. Wouldn't this make the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam happy? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to us as the greatest of nations. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. You were the best of people raised for people, for mankind, for humanity. And this is an ayah that should cause us internally to be moved emotionally, to have our hearts melting at the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose us all to be amongst the followers of the final and most blessed of messengers sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be honored, to be amongst his followers. The honor is not because of us. The honor of the greatest ummah is because of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Qur'an. The final message, this one, unlike any message before, this one preserved, miraculous, that even a young child of speaking to a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, how do you know Islam is the truth? What would you say to a non-Muslim about the Qur'an? And they started to explain and explain and explain in their own words. Even children can understand how miraculous the Qur'an is. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that we are the best of nations, but brothers and sisters pay attention and this is the crux of what we are talking about. It is because of three things amongst others. تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You command good, you forbid evil, and you believe in Allah. Again, you're commanding what is good, encouraging and commanding what is good. You're forbidding what is evil, and you are believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You believe in Allah. Let's take this part of the ayah and a few reflections and move forward from there inshaAllah. Number one, one of the scholars of tafsir from the first generations, Mujahid rahimahullah, he said, you are the best of people, but only if you are fulfilling the condition mentioned in this ayah. You can't just say the best of umam without recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala linked it to what you command good. You forbid what is evil. You believe in Allah. You command what is good. You forbid what is evil. And you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the goodness of the ummah and the status and the izza, the honor of this ummah today, and for it to be revived as well as it was in the past, is linked to our exemplification, our lifestyle, living upon what? Commanding what is good, forbidding what is evil, and believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the three things mentioned in this ayah, the core of what it means to be amongst the best of nations. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ukhrijat lin nas. Who is this for? It's for all people. You have something valuable today that the entire world is in need of, even though many people don't recognize it. Many people don't know that the things that they are looking for, you have it. And when I say you, I mean every single person who is here. And every Muslim who listens to this. You have something precious and valuable. But sometimes we don't know how precious it is. Sometimes we ignore, we neglect this great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. So every single one of us here has a role to play. Yes, I'm speaking even to the youngsters as young as five, six, and seven years old. We all have a role to play in our own way, of course, with our own connections, networks, capacity, skills, talents, settings, circumstances. Your role might be to raise the best of children amongst the greatest of the ummah. Your role might be to raise the children of this generation who will impact the future of the world following the footsteps of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How many people have embraced Islam in recent years and it is the fastest growing religion in the world? How many people have embraced Islam and they are very young still learning about Islam, about life? Just recently in Ramadan, in Dearborn for example, there were a number of people coming to the masjid or calling or emailing, wanting to say their shahada, wanting to embrace Islam. Amongst them, a 17-year-old in the first week. And I thought that was amazing. Alhamdulillah, 17 years old, learning about Islam. Think about the person who told her about Islam. The person who gave her da'wah. Similar in age to her. There was also a 14-year-old who took her shahada at the end of Ramadan. 14 years old. Who gave her da'wah? A 16-year-old who embraced Islam a year before. Allahu Akbar. Don't think you're too young to give da'wah. Don't think you have no role to play. Every single one of us has some role to play. There's something you can do. Ukhrijat lin nas. The problems you see around the world can be alleviated through what you have of Islam. In addition, number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says lin nas. For all people, for all of mankind. Meaning what? For Muslims and non-Muslims. You have something important with you. Something to offer. 
the problems that people are talking about all the time, social justice causes, oppressions all around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of those who are oppressed in every land and every place. Say, Ameen. We have the solutions to these problems through Islam, through revelation. Some people are so passionate about social justice. They'll share all the news stories they can share. They'll talk about it all the time. But the solution that they're trying to use to solve the problem is anti-Islamic, contradicts revelation. In fact, it may even be prohibited in many forms. And they wonder, why is this thing not being solved? Our ummah needs to go back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the solution to these problems. You cannot have activism or social justice that's not guided by objective truth and objective morality. When the number of good people giving da'wah advising others in their own forms with your family, your friends, your classmates, your teachers, your co-workers. When that decreases in society, al-muslihun decrease in society, islah decreases in society, goodness will decrease as well. And evil will increase. May Allah protect us. Allahumma ameen. And the last point on this ayah is that if you are not amongst those who are calling others to good, and that's not within your capacity, you are not required to be in that state, in that position, in that role. However, at least be receptive when the advice comes to you. At least be supportive when you see their mission, their work, their activism, their da'wah. What do I mean by this? There are many people who are not in a role in which they think they can impact others, although they can. And they sit back and all they're doing is criticizing, looking for flaws in other Muslims, judging, condemning, putting down, Rather than making dua for others, advising others, finding a way to support. Always trying to tear down institutions, organizations, scholars, activists. Who's going to be left? If all you're doing is refuting everyone who's out there, every organization because of mistakes that they make. And yes, we want them to improve. We want to give them advice. But if what you're doing is canceling them or tearing them down, how do you expect that anyone will learn Islam from anywhere? At an MSA event just a few months ago, a young woman came up and said, I feel like I have so many doubts and I don't know who to listen to. And any organization I try to listen to, I found that you know, so-and-so has refuted them. So what do you think? What should I do? I feel like I have doubts about Islam now. I don't know how to practice. I don't know who to listen to. I said, why do you have a doubt about so-and-so scholar? She said, well, I saw a video that they did this and that. I said, that's out of context, that's not the right way, that's not the right understanding. The refutation video has problems, I wouldn't recommend you take that. Well, the other scholars also have mistakes, and I heard that they do this and that. The institutes, this and that. I'm like, la ilaha illallah. Some Muslims do not realize that as soon as you criticize and condemn other Muslims very quickly, what you might be doing to someone else who does not know any better about where to learn and how to learn, you might be taking away the only thing that they have in which there is a lot of good. Let's work towards improving our organizations, our institutes, advising one another, advising scholars, advising activists, without tearing people down. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilize us to make things better, not worse. Allahumma ameen. If we were to summarize some action items about being the best of nations, and the Prophet sallallahu mentioned that we are the most honored to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the last of 70 nations in one hadith, meaning of many nations, and the most beloved to Allah, it is linked to your actions. What are you going to do? It's not enough to say, I identify as a Muslim. You want to at least follow something that resembles the characteristics mentioned in the Quran about the greatest of umam. We'll take three things and we'll end with this inshallah. So for those who are taking notes, this is it inshallah ta'ala. Number one, unite upon the truth and do not divide. Unite upon the truth. Don't just unite. Unite upon what is true, what is pleasing to Allah, and do not divide. Do not be like those who divided and they disagreed after the truth came to them. Brothers and sisters, we are more in need now than ever to bring our hearts together, to bring Muslim communities together, to bring our diverse, even fiqh opinions, as long as they are within the orthodoxy of Islam, together, and they are very, very diverse. It is important now more than ever, especially for Muslims living in the West, to unite 
and not divide. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our hearts united. Allahumma ameen. We can agree to disagree about many things, but our hearts should not have enmity within them. Number two, hold tight and fast to the Quran. One of the most beautiful reflections for those who are into tadabbur and tafsir is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Quran as guidance, huda, and as mercy, rahmah. And at the same time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the afterlife, He speaks about the believers, rahmatillah, that they are with or within the mercy of Allah, encompassed by it. Many scholars say, this is referring to paradise, encompassed by the mercy of Allah and the reward of Jannah. So you are linking here two different references of mercy. The first, if you follow and hold tight and close to the Quran, the mercy in this life, you are guaranteed access to the mercy of the next life. And we have for many authentic ahadith that the one who places the Quran in front of them, it will lead them to paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them. What does this mean? To recite it, to recite it on a daily basis. To re reference it and reflect on it. And to try to memorize what you can of it and to teach it to others as well. Study, internalize, implement, and teach. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the people of the Quran. Allahumma ameen. And finally, number three, is to normalize giving advice and receiving. To normalize al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. The characteristic of the believers, the greatest of umam, is that they give advice, they encourage, and they receive that advice. And one of the most difficult things for people to do is to receive. It's easy to give advice. MashaAllah, some people are so quick to command what is good in their minds. Sometimes it's not even accurate. A young brother, one time, as teenagers, we walk into the masjid. He's different now, alhamdulillah. I'm starting off with that preface. We walked into the masjid, and he's like, stop, look. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, see all their ankles? I'm like, yeah. They're all in hell. I'm like, like, what do you say? He's like, they're all going to the hellfire because the Prophet Sallallahu told us the one who's closed and the ankles are this and then they're going to be in the hell. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, I'll show you. I saw the hadith. I saw somebody talking about it. I'll show you. I have a booklet. Like, they're all going to hell. Why are we praying with them? La ilaha illallah. Now, alhamdulillah, the brother in years developed, transformed, changed, and learned many things. But when I heard that, I was shocked. And you cannot assume that the one who's trying to command good necessarily has a bad intention. Maybe he has a good intention. He saw hadith. Somebody described it the wrong way, out of context. No fiqh at all. What does he do? He goes around telling everyone, you're all upon bid'ah. You're all upon haram. You're all going to hell. Well, who's going to heaven? What, do you, what are you talking about? Is this the real understanding of Islam? Is this what the scholars have stated? Or is it one person? Is it a scholar or two who said, don't listen to anyone else, just listen to me. Everyone's misguided, I'm upon the truth. That's not Islam. That's not how the Sahaba learned. That's not what the Tabi'een learned. That's not what the scholars developed of the fiqh, madhahib, and manahij, and the usul. What are you talking about? Your approach is everything. Your knowledge is also important. We must become and normalize giving advice and receiving advice. Umar radiallahu an and Farooq is the one who said, may Allah have mercy on the one who shows me my flaws. Most people today would say, how dare you judge me? Why are you talking to me? Live your life and let me be. Don't talk about my problems. Don't judge me. Umar radiallahu an said, may Allah have mercy on the one who shows me my flaws. Why? At the end of the day, do you want to be happier and safer on the day of judgment? Yes. How will you improve if you don't know you have a flaw? How will you improve if you're not recognizing something is wrong? The way you're talking to your neighbor, your parent, your wife, your, ch your child, your daughter, that it's not right. If nobody ever advises, we will never improve. We'll struggle rather, I should say, we'll struggle to improve. May Allah have mercy on the one who advises us. Obviously, with sincerity, with humility, in the right approach, prophetic manner, we must be receptive to nasiha. One of the influences of liberalism today is to live and let be. In other words, religiously, don't make people feel bad that they're doing the wrong thing. Because if I'm happy with my lifestyle, that should suffice. But if my lifestyle is wrong, it doesn't matter if I'm happy now, if I'm going to regret it on the day of judgment. We're going to look back and say, why didn't my family, my friends, my community, why didn't people advise? Why was everyone so shy and reserved? We're not saying be harsh. Be rude, no, that contradicts the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. The mercy to mankind. Give advice in a prophetic manner. But at the end of the day, we should want to increase the amount of goodness in society. 
Al-Amir bin Ma'roof, how else should society change if people are not collectively working to change it? And we should always be receptive and humble when someone advises you, take the advice, forget the fact that the person who advised you, they might be terrible at giving advice. They might not know how to give nasiha, but they gave you some nasiha. Take it and think about it. If there's some good in it, act upon it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us social justice causes oppression, injustice in every nation, in every place that you see around the world today. We're not just talking about Al-Aqsa. We're not talking just about the Uyghurs. We're not just talking about India or Kashmir or Afghanistan. We're talking about people oppressed in every land, in every place today. If you want those problems to be resolved and you're sincere in that claim, it's going to come through the Muslim Ummah of two billion, the followers of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, living upon Al-Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi Anil Munkar. Because morality that is subjective will not solve those problems. Secular humanism will not solve those problems. Atheism will not solve those problems. It is going to be the Muslim Ummah's responsibility to use the solutions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and to show society in different ways in a multifaceted form that this is the solution to the problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this massive blessing and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us grateful for this blessing and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings and to make us amongst those who truly live upon the greatest ummah's characteristics, commanding good, forbidding evil, and believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he is pleased with us. And more importantly, for all of our sakes, it's not just about the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al hayyul qayyum is always there. And he's watching you. He's seeing your deeds today. So turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with effort, with perseverance, with patience, knowing what? He is pleased with you. He is happy with you. He is with you and he is watching over you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us and our loved ones and grant us the highest levels of Jannah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify our affairs and perfect our relationships and our communities and make us an ummah who's commanding good, forbidding evil and believing consistently with conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ameen wa salli lahum ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.